Good morning. morning. Happy Sabbath to you. It's good to see you all here today. I know this is the time of the year when people go all go all around. We have people traveling. I'm sure we have some visitors here who are traveling this direction. And if you are doing that, we want to welcome you as well. In fact, we have a special way of connecting. In the pew in front of you is this little card that says welcome, connect on there. We would love it if you would fill one of those out if you're visiting us or if you're, even if you're a member and you are looking for some way that, that we can serve you as a church, just take a look at that. The easiest way to, to turn this in is just put it in the offering box, which is straight out those double doors. Rather than passing a plate, we have an offering box and you can just stick it out there or you can give it to any one of the elders or any of the pastors and we'll make sure that it's taken care of. You'll also notice there's another thing in your pew, and that is our prayer card. And at the end of our songs of praise, Heather will mention that it's time to bring your, your prayer requests forward, and that'll be a time when you can take these, you can put them in the elders' Bible, and then they will be distributed to the elders to pray about your prayer requests throughout the week. And so I always encourage people to fill those out now so that you're ready when it comes. Also, if you would like for people to know who they're praying for in specific, you might want to put a name on there. And the elders keep these within confidence within the group of elders. But you can put your name on there. And if you do them a really great favor and write legibly, it helps them to be able to do that as well. We've had a few where we just, and the elders are great about it. They say, Lord, you can understand what this is. Please fulfill their, their need. But they would love to be able to read it and actually um, actually pray specifically. We've been having a great summer. Our TNTs, are, we're, we're getting close to the end of our TNT series, Thursday Nights Together, but we still are continuing that. And our final one will be August 3rd. If you are interested in being part of the baseball game for that, um, just check out the newsletter and sign up there by Monday. We've got to give our numbers into the, into the team by Monday. Um, also want to mention one of the events that is generally very well supported is our Highland Elementary School Work Bee, and that is scheduled for July 30th from 9 to noon. And so we encourage you to come on out, put some sweat equity into your school, and um, it's, a, it's a good time of fellowship as well. I've been to lots of churches in my life, and I have never been to a church where the parking lot was fuller for a work bee. So I'm very proud of Highland for supporting our elementary school that way. Also, speaking of elementary school, you'll notice that there's an announcement about the back to school bash. And, um, and so keep that in, in note there. And then on the 5th of August, which is the first Sabbath of that month, we're, we're going to be having our name tag Sabbath, where we'll be able to have name tags and and it'll kind of help us to be able to, have you ever had that awkward moment when you're like, I know that person, but I can't remember their name. And so you just decided to say, hi, right? So we're hoping that doing the name tag once a month will kind of help us to be able to uh, connect better. So that'll be that day. Then we'll have our potluck. Then after that, we encourage you to stay around. We're going to be doing a prayer walk. That means we'll divide up into three groups. And we'll be praying over the elementary school, the academy, the church, as we get ready for the new school year to begin. We just want this place to be prayed over, filled with the Holy Spirit, because that is the mission of this campus. Every part of this campus has the same general mission, just looking at it from a slightly different angle. So I encourage you to, to pray for that. Now, a lot of the teachers will be gone because they have a teacher's meeting, but... That's okay, we can pray for them while they're on their meeting. So I'd like to have you keep that on your calendar. Also, we have a few other events coming up. We're going to be starting to have some short training uh, sessions. These are, uh, some of these are just for our church members. Like the first one is fostering spiritual friendships. How do you make friends or take your friendships and turn them into something that's spiritually uplifting? That'll be October 7th. October 27 is about how to um, study the Bible. 
And that one is one that you can invite your friends to because a lot of people, you know, it's one thing to read your Bible, but it's another thing to study your Bible. And so Pastor Benji will, will be spending two weekends talking about that. And then in, in February, D. Casper will be doing a 10-day evangelism series. So keep that in your, uh, on your calendar and in your prayers as well. I'd like to invite Chad Watkins to come up. He's got an exciting announcement about our academy. Come on up. Hey, good morning, everyone. Yeah, hey, uh, as you know, it's, we're only a few weeks away getting back into it. Uh, I'm excited. I know uh, the, uh, I don't know if Camden's excited yet. I think he's been enjoying his summer, but I think the young people are getting excited too. But I just wanted to introduce to you uh, a new staff member. Uh, they are, they're here uh, today. I'm going to ask uh, Darley and his wife Blanche and their two boys to stand up in the back. I'm sure they love me for doing this to them. But uh, Darley and his family are from Wisconsin. They're, he's our new uh, vice principal of finance. Uh, here at the school, and so I'm just really excited to have them here, and I just wanted you guys to know who they are so that you could introduce yourself to them, uh, hopefully at some point before the day is over. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, and welcome to Highland, Darlie, and your family. We look forward to getting to know you and having you part of our community. Um, let's see here. Looking through I think that's all that I have. All right, Dr. Littell and Pastor Benji have a met us special announcement they also want to make. Thank you, Pastor Steve. I don't know if you know this, it's the end of the year. Did you know that? The end of the fiscal year, yeah. It's tricky for a church uh, that sometimes when you're in the middle of July, you realize it's the end of the year because most of us, you know, it's January to January. Um, but in that, I just want to take a moment and recognize how God is blessing this church. And it's not just about money. I, I don't want to make it about money. It's, it's the, that the opportunities of ministry that we've been able to do this past year through your donation of time, energy, giving. And I just want to say a special thank you to Linda Preston and Dr. Littell as they are two of our integral part of our financial team that keeps us as pastors and board, making sure we're on that straight and narrow road. Uh, but in that, you can see in our bulletin, we have a section called Total Giving there. And I just want to recognize that our yearly budget is 220000 And because of you and your gracious giving and allowing God to work through you, we've received $235,010 year to date. Uh, and, and that is a huge blessing because... You know, to be honest, how many noticed in the hallway it's a little warm out there? Yeah, anybody? Nobody? Nobody noticed it's a, little, it's a little warm. Yeah, yeah. And in our office, where our office has been closed, it's warm. It's because we had two AC units. And, it, and the air condition is not glamorous or anything. But because of that and because of your giving and the, and the extra that we had, we were able to cover that without going uh, into debt or, or trying to borrow and that kind of thing. And so, again, we are grateful uh, of the ACs, obviously. They're going to be installed this next week. Uh, but more important than that, we are grateful for allowing us as a church to minister in the different ways that we do, whether it be uh, through our, our giving to our academy and elementary school, whether it be opportunities of evangelism, whether it be our literature, uh, you know, our bookshelves out there that we're able to give, whether it be uh, women's ministries, no matter what the ministry we have, community service, pathfinders, I mean, there's so much activities that are happening in this church, but all of them are directly involved in growing for the kingdom, and that's what it's about. So I just want to say thank you to you all, church, for your giving, and we praise God for what he has given us, and we pray that we are wise stewards. Dr. Littell, would you, would you have a prayer of blessing over this and, uh, and, and share with us? If you don't mind, if you could please stand, we'll have a prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I want to lift your people up today in thanksgiving for their generosity to the church. Open the windows of heaven and pour showers of blessings upon them, the ones that you have promised for their faithfulness over the last year. They have strengthened my faith in your ability to provide. We want to recognize your blessings and remember that every gift 
comes from you and give you the praise for all of them. Continue to give wisdom to our finance committee so that we can be faithful stewards of the funds that are donated. Come now, Heavenly Father, and be in our presence as we begin our worship of you today. In Jesus' name, who gave his all for us, amen. amen. Please remain standing for our opening song, number 476. Please be seated. This morning's uh, offering appeal goes to our local church budget, and I find it not a coincidence uh, that, uh, that Dr. Littell and Pastor Benji shared with you a little bit uh, about where our, our church stands financially. In fact, uh, this past Tuesday in our church board meeting, we had a chance to take a little deeper look into the overall finances of the church. And folks, it's a true blessing uh, to finish the year in the black. And not only that, did we finish the year in the black, but we had just enough left over to address the air conditioning issues that need to be addressed in the office and out in the foyer. Those, folks, those are blessings. And the local church budget, budget is a direct result to the giving that you give to that. And that's what our budget is for today. It is for the overall operation of this church. And there's a hundred different things that I could share with you that that money goes to. But today, I just want to offer thanks. And I want to encourage you to continue to support this incredible ministry that we have here at Highland. And as a reminder, of course, you can uh, give your offering online. Uh, you can drop it off in the offering box in the foyer. Of course, you can mail it into the church, whichever you see. Let's go to the Lord in prayer one more time, offering our thankfulness. Father God, I just pray today, again, uh, Lord, we're just reminded of your goodness to us and your goodness to this church and the people that make it up. And so, Lord, today, as we're, as we're given an opportunity again uh, to give back to you, to give back to our church, Lord, I just pray, pray that you would multiply uh, the offerings that are received, Lord, and that not only would continue to further the work of this church, but, Lord, that it might mean that your return would be just that much sooner. So, Lord, thank you for your love today, and this we do pray. Amen. It's now time for our children's story. I want to invite you boys and girls to come on up. Uh, of course, we have our little church house up here in the front. All of those monies that are collected go directly to our uh, elementary school uh, and education. So uh, don't leave any dollar left unturned out there in the, in the, in the pews, boys and girls.
Good morning, children. How are you guys doing today? All right, so how many of you have been called by your parents and you said, just a minute? How many of you said that? How did that go over for you? <laughs> well, our story is about a young girl named Janet who told her mom, just a minute. So our story starts out with our, the mama. She's in her kitchen. She's putting eggs in a basket for their neighbor, Mrs. Jones. Well, she needed her daughter to take these baskets over to her neighbor. And so she called her. She said, Janet, Janet, and no answer. So she called her again, Janet, and behind the woodshed, she heard, just a minute, Mama, and her mom was not very well pleased. Well, she, she, uh, she said, but I need you now, and she heard, just a minute, came floating back from Invisible Janet, and so she tried and tried, and she waited five, 10, 15 minutes, and so she went to the window and she was about to yell when Janet came along and she said, here I am, mom, did you call me? And her mom said, I called you a long time ago and I needed you, needed you to come now. And so she said, but mom, I was washing my dolly's clothes and I was busy. And her mommy said, I don't care, you needed to come when I called you. And so Janet said, yes, mom, and took the eggs to her neighbor. Well. She had gotten back to her, to where she was washing her dollies with her mom's tin bucket, with her wash rags and everything. And so she kept going. And then her mom said, Janet, I need you. And what did she say? Just a minute, mom. <laughs> so her mom, not well pleased again, she said, she had already forgotten. And then we'd have to learn some other way. Once. Uh, once more, the minutes passed, five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, no sign of Janet. But meanwhile, mom went on with her dinner, and when she had finished, she cleared the table and half uh, representing her decision when an unusual sound caught her ears. Oh, mama, mama, come quick, come quick. The water spilled all over me. Slightly a bright idea came to her mother. Feeling that sure that nothing serious had happened, she called out, just a minute, Janet. <laughs> oh, come quick, come quick, wailed Janet. My shoes are full of water. Mom didn't stir. She merely called back one more time, very deliberately. Just a minute, Janet. And at, the at, the, at this poor, soaked Janet appeared around the corner. What a sight she was. She had jumped off the stool. After hanging her dolly's uh, clothes on the line, she had brought a tub full of water on top of her. Mama couldn't help but laugh. Why didn't you come when I called, said Janet, very crossly. Can't you see I'm all wet and messy? I couldn't, Mom said. You see, I was busy. I had to clear the table after dinner. And Janet asked, is it that late? And she said, yes, said Mom. If you had come when I called, this wouldn't have happened. Janet saw the point and was faint. A little smile flickered across her dear little face. And of course, at the end of it, for Mama ran to get her some dry clothes. And while Janet promised one more that she would really never uh, keep Mama waiting again. The more of the story is that, one, don't make your parents wait. It's not a good idea. <laughs> Two is God's going to call on us, and we can't keep him waiting because it is our job to share the light with the world. You can go back to your seats. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. I hope you brought your singing voices with you to church today. We're going to sing some songs. We are a church that is blessed with musical talent. It seems like every, the more I get to know people, the more musical talent just pops out of the woodwork. We've got Nikki here that we got to meet a few weeks ago up here singing. Of course, you know Melissa and me. We've been up here before. But Tim Jewett plays the fiddle. Who knew? So thank you so much for joining us. And David Scarborough, he is a good friend of the premises, and he can tear up a guitar, I tell you. So we're going to enjoy some music together, and please sing along with us. We're going to sing Power in the Blood. It's our first song. Would 
Next song is Here I Am to Worship.
It's now time to come forward and bring those prayer cards. If you have a prayer request written out that you would like to share with the elders this week to pray over, now's that time to bring that card down as we sing our prayer song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Let's pray together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. thank you for this wonderful time we have to come together and pray in your name. Thank you for the many blessings of this past week, for being with us, for keeping us safe, for taking care of our needs, for being the wonderful God that you are. Many of us have traveled, many of us have been among things that could be dangerous, and you've kept us safe. Thank you so much. We thank you for this nice, cool sanctuary we're in today for two wonderful schools that are, we can't come up with enough words to describe what a blessing it is you've given us here for those schools. And even though it's kind of empty in here right now, we're looking forward to soon having this sanctuary full of kids, students who love your name and are, will be worshiping with us. Lord, I pray for all these cards that have come forward this morning. There are many here, and some are giving you thanks, some are asking for you to be with them in a time of trouble. Please be with them, guide us in the way we should go. I also like to add to that Isabel Hanger who lost her father last night. For those of you that remember the Hangers, please pray for them. Be with our pastor Benji today as he brings your word to us, help us to Apply what we learn today to our lives for your glory. And thank you, Lord. Amen. Good morning, church family. Today I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Our passage comes from Judges 8, 22 through 23. Then the Israelites said to Gibeon, Be our ruler. You and your son and your grandson will be our rulers, for you have rescued from us Midian. But Gibeon replied, I will not rule over you, nor will my son. The Lord will rule over you.
Turn in your Bibles to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. And uh, we've been on a journey, Pastor Steve and I, through the book of Judges. And the theme is called Broken Saviors. And in Judges chapter 2, verse 18, you, you can see why. Because as I said from the very beginning, if you read the book of Judges starting in chapter 1 to the end... It is not a happy story. You, there are some weird stories in there. Some incredibly disturbing stories that the judges themselves are trying to stop the people of Israel from doing. But there's also some disturbing stories of the judges themselves. And as you read through, the judges get worse and worse, it seems, until the very end of the book, where it seems nothing is going to save them. But here in, in chapter 2, verse 18, we, we find the language of why the Lord was raising up these broken saviors. It says in verse 18, whenever the Lord, Yahweh, raised up judges for them, the Lord, Yahweh, was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. And he saved them from the hand of enemy all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those afflicted and oppressed. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt. They, being the, 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 the Hebrews, the Israelites, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. You, you see, even in, the, in the, the biblical narrative, it is trying to tell you here in chapter 2 that as you're going to read the rest, because this is kind of the prelude to Judges, as you're going to read from chapter 2 on, each judge is going to happen, and there's going to be salvation. There's going to be a savior moment in the story, in the narrative. But as the story moves through... The next group that comes after, after that judge dies, is actually going to be what? Worse, the text says, than the ones that come before. And it is so true with the judges. As, as time goes on, each, the next judge that God picks seems to be worse. Even though he seems righteous in his time, it's worse than the previous judge before. And so it's the, the book of Judges is built in a narrative fashion that is supposed to grab your attention and like shake you and make you uncomfortable and make you like, like awkward, like we shouldn't read this as bedtime stories to our children. And here we have the same. Pastor Steve so eloquently last week shared with us, turn in your Bibles to Judges chapter 8. Judges chapter 8. We have the story of Gideon and why Gideon seemed to be a flawed judge, a broken savior. Some good things happen. We, we know the story and Pastor Steve preached it through to that. But there's a dot, dot, dot to the end of the Gideon narrative. You know, when we read Hebrews, we can, we can become very confused because in Hebrews, the faith chapter, you get this narrative that says, by faith, here are all the people. Look at how faithful these people were. And the book of Hebrews lists all these different judges, and actually Gideon is in one of them and says, if I had time to tell you all the stories of all these great people, the people of faith, you know, it would go on forever. And, and I wish I did. And, and the book of Judges calls these people faithful. But if you read the end of the story of Gideon, how can he be called faithful? Because here in, in chapter 8, we get the rest of the story. Verse eight, chapter 8, verse 22. And, and, and Camden, thank you for reading this morning from the Bible, the scripture that we had. And we're bow tie buddies. Thank you. Well done. But it says, then the men of Israel said to Gideon, in, in chapter 8, verse 22, then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us. You see, Israel, they wanted a king. It was time. It was like they were begging God to give them a king. They had looked around at all the other nations. And remember, Israel was brought into the promised land. The promised land was, be, was to be a blessing to the other nations. They were to be, the, to be the example of the other nations. They were to live as God called them to live, not as the other nations called them to live. And all of a sudden, Israel 
Israel gets put into the promised land, and instantly they, they start comparing themselves with their neighbors. And instead of saying, we, we are comparing ourselves to what God has called us to, they start looking outside and saying, hey, that looks fun to do. Well, let's do that. Let's bring this in. Let's bring that in. That can be a narrative that we could probably preach about, but we're not going to. I don't have time. And soon Israel, instead of being a blessing to those around, became like those around, which is a curse. And slowly death and destruction was brought into the promised land. It was brought into the Eden what was supposed to be. But here in this narrative, Israel, the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, become our king. Even God is supposed to be our king. Yeah, we know that. But, but you and your son and your grandson, and you, so you see the beginning of the calling for a king and a kingship. For you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Boy, how quickly did they forget how quickly Israel forgot who saved them. Gideon had 300 people. And, 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 and you got to remember the story. The whole narrative that Pastor Steve prayed through is the foolishness of Gideon, how he's needing a sign after sign. He, he literally had the angel of the Lord or Yahweh, depending on how you're reading that text. He had God literally come down and tell him this is what's going to happen. Then not only that, he had the, 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 the offering get burned up. Then not only that, he had the, 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 the fleece both times. Then not only that, he had the the, the, the dream, they had the men, all the counting, the horns, all the, the dark, all of this stuff, and all of it screams at you as a biblical reader and hearer to say, Israel, Gideon had nothing to do with this. Did you catch that? The narrative doesn't say that, but you as a reader have to understand that the, re- that, that the scriptures are screaming out saying there is no way that 300 people carrying torches and a horn can battle Midian. And here, the men of Israel missed it too. It says, look, you have saved us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said, no. Oh, Gideon's still being good. Here it is. Gideon said, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord Yahweh will rule over you. Praise God. Gideon gets it. Yes. Gideon's a good judge. He's not a broken savior. He's a good one. How many of you ever had the opportunity, as, as you know, to watch YouTube? Not that you should, I'm just saying maybe you have in the past watched YouTube. I like to go to YouTube when something is broken in my house. My wife loves when I say to her, listen, I can fix this. You've heard stories of me preaching about this. A few years ago, my wife's car its brakes were making a weird high-pitched squeal, which for those of you that deal with any kind of auto mechanics, you probably know most likely uh, the brakes are worn down and she had disc brakes. And so, you know, the pads were worn down and and you hear that that, that squeal that's supposed to be the alert that the, the brakes are worn and you need to change them. And I said to my wife, I said, Hark, they have rockauto.com, they have AutoZone, they have O'Reilly's, I can pay to get brakes here shipped to Amazon, delivers brake pads. She says, Do you, have you ever changed brakes before? I said, no. But I have an instruction manual. She's like, what's the instruction manual? I said, it's YouTube. She said, listen, this is my car. This is my life. You do whatever you want with your car and your life, but this is mine. Are you sure? I said, babe, would I put your life at risk if I thought I couldn't do this? I've watched it. It literally took 15, 20 minutes per break. I said, if they can do it on YouTube, I can do it in real life. She said, but Benji, you've never done it before. I said, but I have someone telling me what to do. To her, I don't know, foolishness or what love for me, she agreed to allow me to attempt to change her brakes. Church, I can show you the YouTube link if you want to how to change your own brakes. So I got in there and I had my iPad right next to me and I had all the tools. And by the way, if anyone does not know this, here's, here's a hint. I love projects like this, fixing myself, because I get more tools. So I told my wife, it's going to save us money, but I have to buy some tools that will help me do it better. 
So I purchased more tools, got everything. I had everything that, that, that YouTube had told me. I looked up online. I read multiple things. And, and I was saving hundreds of dollars. I was a good steward. We, we could give to the, the, the less fortunate. I could help other people. So I entered into the changing of the brake pads. I, I jacked up. I had to borrow a jack. I jacked up the car. I had, I had stands, and I slowly took one wheel off. And there were the brake pads. It's, it's just like on YouTube. They, they looked the same. It was the exact same car that, that was on. It had a 2013 Honda Accord. I slowly began to take everything apart, all four wheels. It was amazing. It's something about working. With, even though it took them 20 minutes, it may have taken me like two and a half hours. But there's something about working with your hands. And I was, I was just covered in grease and, and black brake dust and everything. And I slowly put everything back together. And I was so excited that huh, I, I slowly lowered everything, put the wheels back on, lowered everything down. And, and there was the car. It was a beautiful thing. Here in, in the book of Judges, chapter 8, we get the rest of the story. And Gideon said, the Lord will rule over you. No, 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 nobody else is going to ru rule over you. The Lord is going to rule over you. Gideon is, is finally getting it. Even though he, he destroyed the Asherah poles and, and the idols at night, he's, he's starting to become more bold. And, and he's starting to get this idea. And all of a sudden, the narrative turns. And it doesn't tell you that this was wrong. It doesn't tell you that all of a sudden, hey, warning, don't do this. It just says, and Gideon said to them, let me make a request of you, the biblical text says. Verse 24. And Gideon said, let, let me make a request of you. Every one of you give me the earrings from his spoil. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, we will willingly give you them. And they spread a cloak and every man threw in it the earrings of his spoil. And the weight of the golden earrings that he had requested was, was 1,700 shekels of gold beside the crescent ornaments and, and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian and beside the collars that there were around the necks of the camels. And, and it's right there, there's this text. And by the way, you as, as a Hebrew reader and hearer need to understand that one of the biggest, like most hideous falls of Israel is recorded right after the Exodus where they get to Sinai, and Moses goes up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, and they're looking around, and Arian, the, the soon-to-be high priest, Israel comes up to him, the Hebrews, and says, listen, Moses isn't here. We want gods that we can see. Because it seems like God isn't around us anymore. Even though the mountain is there, it's on fire. They're, they're literally in the presence of God and they're like, God isn't here. We want something that we can have an image of, they say. And Aaron turns and does what? He asks for all their gold, their earrings. And that fall, that, that, that terrible party that happened that narrative screams and says, this is what is happening. And, and in that, there, there, is this, there is this echo of that here. It says, and he asks for the golden earrings. You should instantly be brought back to that Sinai moment, that Exodus moment where, where Moses is literally in and agreeing to the covenant of God and the children of Israel are immediately after agreeing to what they, they had said, what, yeah, everything he says, we're going to do that. After that moment, he, the Israel turns and instantly follows after other gods. And here, the story takes a turn, verse 27. And Gideon made an ephod. Just a reminder, if you're not sure what an ephod is. An ephod was a priestly piece of garment that was to be worn for knowing the will of God. Did you catch that? 
that the ephod was worn by priests and attached to it would be the Urim and the Thummim, but in it, that, that, that piece of cloth represented the will and knowledge, the foreknowledge of God, understanding what he wanted for us. And Gideon takes this, the very thing that is to be represented as knowing the will of God, knowing what he wants for us, knowing what he, 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 his desire and will for us is, he takes the very thing that represents that to the people of Israel. And he makes, it says, an ephod out of gold. And he put it in his city, in Ophrah. And all Israel, read this, all Israel whored after it there. And it became a snare to Gideon and his family. So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more. And the land had rest 40 years in the days of Gideon. But, but the narrative right there says, and Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city, and all Israel hoard after it. They, they begin to worship it. The very item that was to give us the will and knowledge of God, that became the symbol of idolatry and wickedness. They begin to worship it instead of God. Did you catch that? By the way, if, if you're not sure about all these different times, this isn't the first time this has happened. That, that sometimes in our lives, by the way, the things which were to bring us closer to God gets worshipped instead of worshipping the God the blessing was pointing towards. Have you ever had that in your life? Where all of a sudden you begin to worship the thing that was to bring you to God instead of worshiping the God it was bringing you to? Come on, church. We're no different than Hebrews. We're no different than the Israelites because all of a sudden we can lose focus of, of what the worship is supposed to be after. We can lose focus. And, and we become so intently focused on this item that God did give us that God gave us as a blessing that we begin to worship it instead of God. By the way, we do that with pastors. We do that with friends. We do that with people in our lives. We do that with items that God gives us. We begin to worship it rather than worshiping God. So many times I've heard by people, well, well pastor so-and-so, well, pastor so-and-so says this, and all of a sudden we start to sit at their feet. And it's one thing to understand and appreciate people's preaching and say, hey, they, I, they bring value to my life. But when they become the focus, when they become the interpretation, when they become that which is worshiped almost, they become no different than the golden ephod that the children of Israel hoard after. That the very thing, that, that servant of God who is supposed to be bringing you in, in touch with God and, and, and to worship God, he becomes the worshiped, not the God he's pointing towards. We start to focus more on the gift than the God that gave the gift. And we whore after it. And it happens over and over in the biblical narrative that all of a sudden we, we start to see these moments where God gives us something or, or, or something meant power to us and, and, and they fall backwards. By the way, 2 Kings 18.4. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings 18.4. And if, and if you go there, you will find this little blurb that's inserted into the narrative. And it just sits there in the narrative. And you're like, if you read really fast, you're like, oh, okay. But it's right there. And, and, and as a flashback, Exodus is happening. The children of Israel are wandering through the wilderness 40 years and while they're there their sandals aren't getting worn they're not getting bitten by snakes or scorpions but all of a sudden they begin to to complain and 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 worship after other idols and god all of a sudden into the camp allows the serpents to come the the, the desert serpents and they they begin to kill people and he tells Moses, and there's a whole other story here we won't have time but he tells Moses to build build a bronze serpent and put it on a staff and if you look at it you will be saved from the snakes. And all of a sudden in 2 Kings, this thing, this thing shows back up. 2 Kings 18.4, he removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent. Ooh, whoa, what? He broke into pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. 
They begin to worship that which was supposed to bring the, the worship to God. They begin to worship the bronze snake right there in the text. Over and over again in the Old Testament, you will see these moments where the narrator tells, hey, there, this is what happens, that the children of Israel begin to worship that which was to bring them closer to God. By the way, when Jesus comes and he's standing in front of the Pharisees, they had begun to worship the law so much that they had forgotten to worship the God that brought them the law. And he turns to them and he says, you've missed the point that the law and the prophets were pointing to me, that I was the fulfillment. And you've missed the point. You, be, you, have, you have encircled the law so much that you have begun to worship the law. Ooh, church. That we begin to worship the commandments more than worshiping the God who gave us the commandments to bring us into worship of God. Not to bring us into worship of the law. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Sabbath isn't to be worshipped. Sabbath is to worship God. That the, there's these laws that are here not to be the focal point. They are to be the catalyst that brings us into connection with the God that gave us those things. And here in the Gideon narrative, we see that this is happening and there's tension. And, and number two, God's blessing becomes curses when we run contrary to the rest of his covenantal laws. Did you catch that? That all of a sudden, that which was to bring him closer, he forgot there were other laws that were to be guardrails for us, to keep us from that. I got into the Honda. I was so proud of the job I had done. Hark, I have changed the brakes of my wife's car. It's totally fine. I started it up, looking for warning lights flashing, making sure the brake has pressure, you know, filled up the, the reservoir because, you, 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 you know, you want to make sure everything's ready. And it was, it was purring. I felt so proud. I said, Cartini. <laughs> she wasn't there. She was at work. She had my car. But I said to myself, Cartini, I have done a great thing. <laughs> I am man, hear me roar. I don't know. I just was really proud. You know, the Bible says pride goeth before destruction. It doesn't really mean that, but it did here. Because I, I tested the brakes. They were fine. I pulled out of the, the garage and into the, into the cul-de-sac. I was driving fine. And I, I went about 50 feet and I pressed the brakes again and it, they stopped. It worked perfectly. And I was like, yes, no squeak, no squeal. And I released the brake and the car didn't roll. I said, that's weird. Because usually when you let, let the brake off, the car begins to roll. I said, I pressed the brake again and I released it. Yeah. The car didn't roll. I was like... Maybe it needs a little, little, a little bit of love, is what I thought. It's like, give it a little gas. So I gave it a little gas, and I, I, I felt like there was something still breaking. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Is my emergency brake on? No, I pulled the emergency brake, put it back down. I knew I attached that right, because I had followed what? I had followed the instructions. <laughs> and I pressed the brake again, and I noticed that the brake was further into the floor than it was normally and I noticed that the brake pedal wasn't releasing from being pressed. And I said to myself, <laughs> don't tell Cartini. <laughs> I don't know what I've done. I have messed up. So I put it into reverse and I was like, how am I going to get my car whose brakes are stuck on back into the garage instead of in the middle of the cul-de-sac? And I said, well, just press the accelerator really hard. So I pressed it really hard. And I drove back up very slowly because the brakes were pressed at the same time. And I, and, I, and I got up into the garage. And I turned the car off, put it in park, got out. And I began to do what every good person does whenever they go to buy a new car. They look at it and they kick the tire if it's used. And they're like, yeah, that looks good. It looked good to me. It's like, what's wrong? The, the brakes are on. They They work. Why don't they let go? <laughs> Stop grabbing the brakes. And I, 
And I thought to myself, I have no idea what I've done. And I think a lot of times in our lives, when we get caught in these situations, we don't realize that we've come that far. You, are you catching what I'm laying down, church? That, that it is not all of a sudden one day you wake up and start worshiping other idols. It, should I use the word? It's a slow progression where your intent is good. Because God gives us blessings. He gives us these moments, these times. You know, there's, there's other biblical narratives, uh, and, 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 I'll, and I'll, I'll quickly this morning go through a couple of them. But, but, but as you see, there, there's moments where God asks us to say, listen, even though this is good, I don't want you to hold on to this. But as you read throughout the Old Testament, over and over again, you see moments where Israel, where Abraham, where Jacob does this very thing. They think they're going and following God's will, but they get caught up in a situation and it just goes from good to bad to worse to even worser. And then, and then there's this eternal consequences that ripple afterwards. And the biblical narrative is trying to remind you of these moments because here in, in these moments, the blessings from heaven that raised us to heavenly places becomes a boat anchor that keeps us here on the cursed earth. And how do I know this? Because if you read these moments where Abram, there was a famine in the land, if you read the text. Like, turn, in, turn in your Bibles real quick. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. Now there was famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. You got to remember, he was called out of the place where he was and was given a land flowing with milk and honey where God was going to pour out his blessings on him. It was that Eden moment. It was that Eden narrative that he was going to be fruitful and multiply in this land. And all of a sudden, something comes counter to that narrative. A famine shows up. And the first thing Abram does is actually pray for God's guidance and wisdom to how to survive the famine in the very land he was told that was his. Is that what the narrative says? No, no. It says there was famine in the land. And he went to Egypt. What happens in Egypt? A lot of bad stuff happens in Egypt. He, he gets his maidservant, Hagar. We know the rest of the story that with Hagar. He gets stuck down there and a plague falls on Egypt because Abraham becomes the liar, the deceiver. Oh, this is my sister. <laughs> the narrative plays on this idea of Abram not trusting in God. Not only in the fact that he, he didn't say this was my wife, but in the fact that he even left the land that he was given just because there's a famine doesn't mean that God can't provide. Come on, Elijah, the widow. Just because it feels like we're in a famine doesn't mean that you're not still living in the blessing of God. By the way, the narrative repeats in the story of Jacob. Further down, Jacob has this same thing. There was famine in the land, and, 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 and all of a sudden this famine leads to it. And, and you see this moment where, where Isaac also has this moment. Isaac and Rebekah, turn in your Bibles just a little further. The narrative says this. And there was famine in the land, and Isaac is told by God not to do this very thing. And in that, Isaac is, is he, he, it says in the text, it says, there was famine in the land. Chapter 26 of Genesis. Now there was famine in the land, besides the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him. And here the text says, do not go down to Egypt, he says. Here the narrative actually explicitly says, don't do what your father, what, did. And Jacob, even though he obeys and doesn't go, he does the exact same thing his father does. The narrative repeats and says, you see a chosen one doing the exact thing, taking a blessing from God and, 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 and saying, oh, God can't work this out, I'm going to, and we become greater than God. And you know the story there. Bimelech sees Isaac's sister, and a plague falls on them. 
Over and over again, there are these stories within the biblical narrative. By the way, Jacob, the story of Jacob and Joseph, you don't miss this, church. What, what was, was Joseph to go to Egypt to be the salvation? Was Egypt to be that, that moment of salvation for Jacob and his family? There's no question. But there's no question in the narrative that they were not to stay there, that they were to go return to the Garden of Eden. They were to return to that blessing, that hot spot. Not the literal Garden of Eden, but that's what the, the promised land was. It was the symbol of what the Garden of Eden meant. It means God's blessings are enough for you and those around you, that not only that God is gonna bless you, but he's gonna bless others through you. And it becomes a story and they go down to Egypt and they get comfortable down there and they start having offspring and all of a sudden the Pharaoh doesn't remember Joseph which means he doesn't remember Joseph's God which means Israel began to live like those around them come on they begin to worship the blessing and want to stay where they're comfortable and it becomes an anchor and a curse to the children of Israel that they have to be saved from. We have in scripture these blessings that God promises us. Sabbath is a blessing, by the way. We have these blessings. The Ten Commandments are blessings, by the way. It's so interesting that, that people want to turn the Ten Commandments or the laws of God and what am I going to get? Do I get heaven out of it? And if you think about just simply the, at face value, these laws, these blessings, that if I live my life according to them, the very thing of doing the law actually is the blessing. If I don't kill other people, other people aren't going to try to kill me, according to the biblical narrative. That I don't hate my brother, that if, if I don't commit adultery... My marriage is going to be blessed because if I did commit adultery, I'm going to have some struggles there. If I don't lie, I will live through truth. These, these, these very laws are blessings in and of themselves. There's not, yeah, there's heaven coming and there's the news, but, but the reward are the commandments themselves. The Sabbath, when I keep it, is the blessing itself. And here... We find the story of Gideon turning the ephod into something that begins to haunt them in Israel the rest of his life. So how do we avoid this, Pastor Benji? Very simply this. Celebrate God, not the men or women that God puts in our lives. Celebrate God, not the blessings. Celebrate God, not the circumstances. It doesn't mean we can't be thankful for them. I'm thankful for you. You guys are blessings to me. But I'm not going to celebrate you. I'm not going to worship after you. I'm not going to become so fixated on you that, that if God asks me and my wife to move on or to do something different, that I'm going to be like, no, that you be actually become the anchor to the cursed earth than a blessing to this blessed heaven. And that's what I hope is the same, that, that, that I'm going to celebrate God, not the blessing, that when we bought the house, that with God's money, it becomes God's house, and therefore it's God's blessing, and I start celebrating it instead of the house. I start celebrating the God. I don't start to worship it. I don't start worshiping my circumstances that we find ourselves, because circumstances change, and you can, also, you can all of a sudden start doubting that if God is blessing you, depending on your circumstances. And I'm here to tell you, the story of Job is the perfect example of walking in the will of God, walking in the righteousness of God, and being the example that he uses as a universal example. Have you considered my servant Job, Satan? Please don't use me as an illustration, God. Have you considered my servant Job? And Job at the end just continues to praise God. The Lord gives, the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. No matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, even though we think the world and the powers around us and the darkness and confusion, God has promised that if you abide in him, he will abide in you, and you become little Garden of Eden spots where God's blessings flow out of you because God's blessings are flowing into you. You are not the focus. God is. As I took off the tires and looked at the brakes, I realized I had done one thing wrong. That's all it takes, by the way. 
It's something small. It was innocent. I didn't do it on purpose. I didn't even realize I had done it. I don't even know how I had done it, church. I don't know how many of you find yourselves in that situation where you're, you're all of a sudden, you're a Gideon walked up against the wall. And you're like, Lord, well, you're Job. Lord, what, what have I done? And you look back and you take a moment and you realize you can, you can mark the spot where you made the mistake. But our God is a loving God. Our, lo- our God is a forgiving God. Our God calls broken saviors to help broken people because that's our God. I don't know why, but you read from Genesis to Revelation, even in Hebrews, the people he calls, stories do not end well. But God still calls them blessed because of the relationship he has with them and they have with him. My wife came home. I said, honey, good news. I fixed your car brakes. She says, did you? I said, I did. She said, awesome. She says, they work? I said, yeah, they work now. (laughs) She says, what do you mean now? I said, well, I had a little situation. She says, yes. I said, I've got to tell you what happened. So I told her the story, and she's like, you you did what? It did, and you want me to take this on the road? I said, yeah, I love you. I fixed it. She says, are you sure? I said, I did. Trust me. I went around, drove around. I test drove it. It's fixed. How do you know it's fixed? Because I went back and compared everything with the original to make sure it was right as it was supposed to be. I compared everything with the original. What had happened? The brake calipers I had removed. And there's a little hose that runs the brake fluid to create the pressure that closes that and releases it. And somehow, in my brilliance, I had twisted the hose and the caliper 360 degrees to where there was a kink in that brake, to where it would close down, but it would not release. Something so small and innocent that I just took it and I flipped it around, and all of a sudden, It worked. But I only knew that it worked by going back and confirming with the instructions to make sure I was doing it right. God has given us his word as a way to keep us from falling. That with his strength and power and that salvation that we and of ourselves can do this and that is incorrect. Paul's very clear. It's God who works out his goodwill and pleasure in us. So please don't get me. Don't, it is not me. It is, it is God working through me. But God gives us this. He asks us to sit and dwell and meditate on his word so that when we come to these ephod moments, when we come to these points where we find ourselves in a Uh, this isn't looking right. That we have something to go back to and compare and see where we've stepped out of line. And what I love about the story of Judges, that even though we may forget to do this sometimes, God sends people into our lives as judges, broken saviors, to remind us to worship the God, not the blessing. So church, my challenge to you this morning is celebrate the blessing. Excuse me, celebrate the God. Be thankful for the blessings. Be thankful for the people. Be thankful for circumstances. But may all those things bring you into praise and worship of our God.
That is the challenge of walking in a manner worthy of the calling of God. Father God, we find ourselves in these situations all in our lives where just one simple mistake, not even intentional, Lord, unintentional, has put the brakes on our lives. And we're looking around going, God, what's going on? And we put ourselves in these situations sometimes where by no fault of our own, we're like, or like Gideon, by every fault of his, we begin to follow after that which is not you. So Lord, forgive us when we worship the blessing and not the blesser. Forgive us when we worship the people that you put in our lives and not the God who did it. Forgive us so that we can continue on this journey of walking in the manner worthy of the calling of God is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord have his face shine upon you and give you peace. Happy Sabbath, church family.